the one that had paid the price for their sins. And we sit here today enjoying freedom from the guilt of sin because God so loved the world that He gave His Son. Hallelujah. And I thought yesterday as I observed part of the opening ceremonies of uh, this uh, Olympics that are taking place here in Los Angeles, I saw that large crowd and I saw the stirring of the people and um, even the dancing down there in the uh, Coliseum floor. I thought to myself, well, that's, that has some, I'm sure, some merit to it as far as uh, trying to promote peace. And that is one of the primary reasons that uh, it's been promoted in this century is to try and uh, bring the nations together to promote peace. And I, and I don't want to criticize that. As a, I tell you, I'd rather see people down there running in a race than throwing bombs at each other if you have to have the, the, the two uh, choices. But I, I thought what a far cry and a poor uh, substitute that is for being together in the kingdom of God and having the Prince of Peace himself to rule and reign. For represented there in that vast Colosseum were many nations of the world and uh, the different colors and languages and all the differences culturally that are found there and they're trying their best in those things to come to a, a, an understanding of each other and of, uh, and of peace in themselves. But we have found that in the kingdom of God that people can be of different colors, they can even be of different uh, uh, languages and of different uh, culture and background and nations of the world. And in Jesus Christ, they all find that common denominator of peace found in Him, the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. And we all have become like Joseph's coat of many colors that has become immersed in one, one solution. There's one baptism that makes us all one in Christ Jesus so that there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus Christ has changed the color of, the, of Joseph coat and has made it all one color. The color of the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so we sit here today not looking to something that is going to fall apart. They don't really, they really don't know what to expect. There may be terrorism that possibly could uh, interrupt those games. There could be uh, culturally, even though they look like there were a lot of friends down there, it wouldn't take a whole lot. It would take but somebody to rise up and yell something uh, in a derogatory way about another nation or another country to probably change from holding hands and dancing to some fist fights in a situation like that. Because they've not had the root problem taken care of, and that is the selfishness of sin. That's the root problem. And while the world, in its best attempts, you know what that is, the Olympics, uh, I, I enjoy. I think the Apostle Paul, uh, being from uh, Tarsus and being a, of, um, of the type of background that he was, Saul was educated not only in the religion of the Jews, but he was also well aware of the culture of the Greeks and Romans. And you read profusely throughout the New Testament of Paul's writings of his awareness and his familiarity with something that was very prominent in his day, and that was the Olympic Games. And he tells us that one, many run in a race, but one wins the prize. And he says, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. In other words, I don't do as one that shadow boxes, but I know who I'm fighting, and I'm making the blows to count. And uh, he talks about what it takes to have the mastery of a, of a contest and to give yourself to it. So the Apostle Paul was aware, and he made use of these different things in, in, uh, in games and in wrestling matches and... Uh, running marathons and things like that. And so he says to those that he wrote to the Hebrews, he said, uh, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us have patience and run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. 
He's the one that has been the forerunner for us and has run the race. And he's the one that has shown us how to have peace in our hearts. And so as the world, through their attempts, are trying to take a, a, a duster, as a woman would in her house, would this be the solution for a woman in her house if she saw a cobweb? Would that be the solution to just wipe away the cobweb? That would help. And that would wipe away the cobweb. But the answer is to find the spider and to put the thumb on the spider and squish the spider. You won't have a cobweb anymore when the spider is taken care of. And so, with all due respect, they're just brushing at the cobweb with all these different efforts to brush away the problem. But next week or two weeks from now, after all the hoopla and all the shouting and all the different things are uh, finished, there's still going to be animosity between these nations. There's still going to be serious problems and the threat of war and even wars that are going to continue going on because they're simply brushing away the cobweb. They're simply uh, eliminating something off the surface. But they're not going after that which is causing the problem, and that is the selfishness of sin that causes the problem. And God, as Brother Mears has told us, has sent the supreme troubleshooter, Jesus Christ. He's the one that could find the problem. He got right to the root of the problem, for he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, that he through death might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hallelujah. Praise God. We are not subject to that bondage anymore. We don't need to have that uh, bondage of fear of death upon us because Jesus has come. The one has come, the best exterminator that Orkin will ever know has come. Hallelujah. And he can give a guarantee that Orkin cannot give. That this spider can not only be subdued, but it can be kept under death. What's that? One says uh, this uh, roach motel. That these people check in, but nobody ever checks out. <clears throat> There's something inside of us that we've received. This blessed Holy Spirit and the Word of God that comes into our lives through this uh, duality of power that the Lord has invested in us. But we have received power from on high, Jesus promised. And then the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We have this double barrel power within us to eliminate and keep control over that which is causing the problems of the world. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. We have something, and I thought to myself, Lord, would you grant the day someday that we would see something like that uh, Colosseum filled with believers and with someone down there on the field that has something better to say than just people have met here to run some races, but someone would announce to the world with millions of believers. They estimated that two and a half billion people watched the opening ceremonies yesterday. That's over half the population of the world. If that's true, and I, you know, I guess it could be close to that. There's a lot of television sets in, in the world. Can you imagine that half the population of the world was watching <laughs> 84 pianists play Rhapsody in Blue? Now, talk about having things out of balance and how out of kilter. Don't you know that the Lord has a people that he is going to present to this world. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to have, before he comes back, an opportunity to be heralded worldwide. Not something that's soft soap. Not something that really looks a lot just like the world with Jesus Christ written underneath it for some kind of a foundation stone. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, the liberating, the dynamic, the Holy Ghost miracle working power of this true gospel as the faith is in Jesus Christ, the faith that will deliver, I believe that the word backs us up, that there's going to be an in cry in these last time and many, many people, more than has ever heard it before, is going to have the opportunity to hear 
what God has done for the human family. Hallelujah. And we're here today enjoying the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Praise God. Are all of our minds brought in here today from all the walks that we do, from all the jobs that we do, and all the things that we occupy ourselves with? Have we brought them in together and centered them upon the Lord Jesus Christ, giving Him the opportunity to do the miracles? As someone mentioned here Friday night, there are problems that are found in the kingdom of God. But as Brother James Souders told us one time, he said, a church is not to be judged by the number of problems that they have in their midst. For that is why modern day non-Pentecostal ministers have criticized the Corinthian church of the first century. They love to point out, I've heard them repeatedly, point out why they said there was, there was uh, this wrong, and there was this wrong, and this excess, and that excess. And this, they just love to enumerate all the things that Paul the Apostle would uh, uh, write to the Corinthian church and talk to them about their excesses and their uh, being out of balance in certain ways. And they love to point at that and say, see, we don't want to have any of the things the Corinthian church had because they had all these excesses. But Brother James Souders has pointed to us uh, what really is the answer. You do not judge a church by its problems, but you judge a church by how they handle their problems. The Apostle Paul did not say, Corinthian church, enough of you. I'll never have anything to do with you again because you have this problem and you have that problem. But he wrote to them and he told them how to handle their problems. And in the second epistle that he wrote to them, he said, I praise you for you have done what I wrote unto you. You have handled this problem. You have solved that problem. You have taken this to the Lord and the Lord has delivered you from this problem. So a church is not to be judged by its problems. A church is to be judged by how it handles its problems. Hallelujah. And I thank God that we not only have a church where the Lord reigns supreme, where His Word is given supremacy in it, but a church where the people are willing for the Word of God to have free course. Amen. Where the Word of God can settle and handle and deal with sin. Why, there's no church anywhere, ever. The Corinthian church was a church founded by the Apostle Paul nurtured by him for several years and yet they had many many different problems but that church was not thrown away paul did not say that god was going to spew them out of his mouth he wrote to them and told them how to handle the problems and they took his word they took his advice and they handled it. hallelujah so in these last days before jesus comes back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle there's going to be some churches like the corinthian church where though humanity comes in, why listen, where anywhere humanity comes in, you're going to have sin. You're going to have problems. But the Spirit of God is here. And He will perfect. And He will cleanse. Why that is the Corinthian church that Paul wrote to in what is the 2 Corinthians 7, where he talks about, he says, having therefore these precious promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the Spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a holiness that resides within the kingdom of God, but it's to be perfected. It's to be dealt with. And what does he mean when he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. That's why we're here today. Is there any filthiness of the flesh or of the spirit? Why the answer is not to walk out and say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm through with me. I'm just a hypocrite, or I'm through with them. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. The answer is, is to let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. And Brother Mears was giving us these verses from James where it says, cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. Am I, am I using that right? Yeah. Cleanse your hands, you sinner. Who's he writing to? Is he writing to ungodly people? He's writing to people that were saved from their past sins, filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And James says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And what does he say about your, your heart? Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Mourn. Why, listen. That's the answer. That's how to cleanse your hands, is lift them up to the Lord and let Him cleanse them and wash away all filth.
filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Perfecting holiness, that which the Lord has placed within us, is holy. Let it perfect us today. We're in the right place. You've come to the right place to have your hands cleansed and your heart purified. You've come to the right place to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. This is the right place. This is where you can worship God. This is where you can draw close to Him. This is where you can leave His house tonight in a different way. Hallelujah. 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 This is not a place where it's nothing but people that are perfected. It's a place where people are being perfected. There may be numbers of people here that are high in their level of spiritual maturity, but there may be many babes. In fact, shame on a church. Shame on a church where the majority of the people, 99% of the people, are all supposedly spiritual mature, and there's only 1% babies in their midst. Shame on that group of people. There ought to be many children being born continually that are in babyhood, stayed in the Lord, that are maturing, that are continually learning to walk and stumbling and someone is picking them up and encouraging them and saying, come on, you can make it. Hallelujah. I love the family of God. I love our Heavenly Father. He's looking down today and he's saying, come on, my child, take another step. Pick yourself back up. Take another step. You can walk. You can walk. Hallelujah. You can walk in the Spirit. Have you stumbled and fallen? Have you made an attempt to walk in the Spirit and fallen flat on your face? Bruised your forehead on the coffee table? The Lord is here to pick you up and encourage you. You can walk in the Spirit. We can walk in the Spirit. He's given us. We're His children. The Father has said, despite what the little child is thinking, I tried it, I hit my head on the coffee table, I fell down, I don't seem to have the strength, but my father is holding his hands out to me and he's saying, come on, come on, you can walk, hallelujah. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise don't you feel God. encouraged in the spirit of God today? Praise I feel like taking another step in the Lord today. Lord. I want to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying unto the church today. I would that you were hot or cold, but because thou art lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. From here's quoted that verse of scripture to us. That's a very uh, uh, illustrative uh, type of a thing. <laughs> Have you ever drank something and it was so sick? And listen, I ate some Limburger cheese one time. And I'm telling you, for you that love Limburger cheese, forgive me for picking on your favorite cheese. <laughs> but honestly, I don't see how anybody, a dog or a human, could keep that in their mouth. Years ago, when we were in San Gabriel, Becky and I were down at Beaches Market, and I believe that's where it was, and I saw this package in the, in the cheese counter there, wrapped real pretty in aluminum <clears throat> foil by Kraft. And Kraft, I figure, makes a good cheese. I always have made a good cheese that I've ever tasted. And there, so beautiful, was this package of Limburger cheese. And as a child, I used to watch the little rascals, and I used to watch them take Limburger cheese, what they do with it, how, how horrible people would act like. But I had never smelled, never smelled Limburger cheese. We never had it in our house. Never, never did understand why. I know now why we never had it in our house. I never did have anybody offer me a sandwich with Limburger cheese on it. But uh, so I told Becky, I said, Becky, a lot of cheese smells bad, but tastes good. How many know that? Some cheese smells bad, but tastes good. I've discovered that. And so I thought, well, I'll buy this little package of crap and take it home. And, you know, I like to experience all the things that are legal to experience. And uh, so I, I took it home, and I cut that package open, and I sliced a nice slice, and it looked white, looked real delicious. And I was standing in front of the sink, <clears throat> and I smelled it. Oh, it smelled worse than anything I had ever smelled before. But believing that smell does not always tell you taste, I put it into my mouth. And I chomped down just one chomp. And immediately, without even trying, there was an automatic reaction. I did what the Lord said he'd do with us if we were looking for it. I spewed it out of my mouth right into the sink. And I... I spewed a few more times to try and get all of it out, and it still had a terrible taste in there. So I washed it out with water, and the taste was still bad. I went to 
to the cupboard and I brushed my teeth real good with the strongest toothpaste. Still had, I only bit down on it one time. Brushed my teeth several times, the smell was still there, the taste was still there. And finally I grabbed Listerine, it's supposed to kill everything. I gargled several times with Listerine and as soon as the Listerine was gone from my mouth, the taste was still there, so I went to an old standby. I went to some really good, strong chocolate chip ice cream. <laughs> if that doesn't eliminate the taste out of your mouth, nothing will. So I ate a big bowl of ice cream. Probably the flesh was using that as a real good out, just an excuse to eat ice cream. But I ate the bowl of ice cream, and as soon as the chocolate chip was gone out of my mouth, I still tasted Limburger cheese. <laughs> And honestly, I can't, I can't use the King's English to describe what that tasted like in my mouth. <clears throat> Becky, am I telling the truth? For several days I complained. Several days I complained of everything I ate the aftertaste with Limburger cheese. You couldn't tempt me with Limburger cheese. <clears throat> the Lord told us that if we're lukewarm, he'll feel about us like I felt about Limburger cheese. Woo. That's a bad thing to have the Lord feel about me like I feel about Limburger cheese. I don't ever want to put that stuff in my mouth again. I don't want the Lord to ever feel about me like that, that he doesn't ever want to taste how I am again. Make me hot, Lord. Make me fervent. Make me on fire for you at all times, that I might always be pleasing unto your palate that you might always find when you taste my praise and my life and my worship something that's pleasing unto you. As the Apostle Paul said, it might be like a sweet-smelling savor in his nostrils. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want him, when he looks down at me, to go, ah, oh, that's my child. That's, that's something good coming off of the uh, altar there. There's a sweet fragrance coming off of the altar there from my life. How about you? This is the place where all the sweet-smelling fragrance can be poured upon the sacrifice. Where all the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit can be cleansed away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You and I are privileged today to be where the Word of God has free course. Hallelujah. Amen. Where the Spirit of God has free course. Whatever it is. What I like about this place above any other place is that if you come here and you have a need, and you seek after the Lord, your need will be met. Hallelujah. Nobody has called ahead and said, this is going to be only a healing service. Nobody has said, we're going to teach the divine principles of prosperity. Nobody has called ahead and said, we're going to teach uh, how to get along with your wife or your husband. All of these things may happen today, but whatever your need is, the Word of God has its own intricate way of reaching in to your heart and meeting your needs. Several hundred people met here today, all of us in various uh, levels of maturity in the Lord, all of us with different needs, and every one of us can walk out of here today with our needs met in the Lord. Hallelujah. Accomplished through the Spirit of God. Do you thank the Lord for a place like this? Do you thank the Lord that you can have your need met today? Hallelujah. Do you believe that your need can be met today? Why have you come here today? I've come here to worship God and to be at His table. And I know that at His table is everything that I need. At His table is the sweet, is the sour, is the protein, is the strong. Everything that I need is here at His table. Hallelujah. Let us keep the Passover with the sincerity and truth of His gospel. Let us keep the Passover today. Hallelujah. Right. And everyone, I've repeated this several times, but it's really meant something to me. Everyone that sat down that one fateful night in Egypt and ate that first original Passover, when they got up from the Passover table, they got up, they sat down slaves. They sat down slaves when they got up from that table they got up liberated and free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They sat down sick and they got up well. That's a fact. That's a fact. That happened there that one great night for over a million people. All of those that were slaves got up from being slaves free. They were sick and they got up well. And to throw a little icing on the cake, 
when they walked out, as they marched out of that city that night, early that morning, it says the Hebrews, they spoiled the, the Egyptians. They were stuffing jewelry and money and all the back wages that had been owed them all their years of slavery. The Egyptians were filling their pockets with icing on the cake. Hallelujah. Hey, don't tell me that morning when they walked out of there, they didn't feel good. To, to walk out of a place where you'd been under a bondage and slavery, to walk out free and have your slave master poking the riches of his wealth into your pockets and knowing that they were on their way in an adventure in the Lord. Hallelujah. That happened in the natural, from a, from a natural Passover, the keeping of it. We're keeping a spiritual Passover. If you sit down to this spiritual Passover in bondage to something and you eat of the lamb that is there on the table and drink of the wine, you shall rise in faith, whole, free from the bondage, and the Lord will give you all the things that you need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those aren't just nice thoughts. Those aren't just nice words. That's reality to us today in Jesus Christ. That's real in the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, I cannot feel, you pardon me for saying this, I cannot feel that we understand and comprehend very much about what I just said. I cannot feel that we understand that. There's something inside of me that tells me that one of the things that's waiting this latter rain, that's awaiting the restored church, is that there's a door to be opened, there's a light to come on inside of our minds, that things that we know with our mind, things that we've heard from the Word of God, we don't yet really believe it the way it's going to be believed. Hallelujah. Well, Brother Harry, there's no way. The reason the New Testament church accomplished the things they accomplished and turned the world upside down was they did not have different words than we have. They have the identical words and message that we have. But there was a light that turned on inside of many of their minds. And they believed it in a way that we don't yet believe it. The reason you're saved from your past sin is you believed it to the point it was accomplished in your life. The reason you were filled with the Holy Spirit was because you believed it to the point that it was accomplished in your life. But before you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, many of us heard that message and said we believed it. I sought for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for months, believing it was for me. But there came a time when a light went off inside of me and I really believed it in a new dimension, in a new way. I stepped through a door that I had never stepped through before and it became a reality in my life. I believe there's something awaiting us right here before us of words we've heard, a message we believe, but we've not yet believed it like we're going to believe it. We keep looking for a new message. We keep thinking there's some new words, and there's no doubt there are new words that the Spirit of God, through illuminating the Word of God, is going to bring it to us. But I believe that a great share of what's going to bring about this uh, latter rain church and going to turn the world upside down in, our last in these last days is a group of people that have a light that's turned on inside of them to the words that their mind has comprehended but has not yet reached their heart has not yet captured their imagination of who we are and what the Lord has done and what He has out in front of us. Hallelujah! It behooves us to cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I see, but I see men as trees moving about. Touch my eyes one more time, dear Lord, and let me see the vision as it really is in Christ Jesus. You may be able to quote different scriptures talking about what the Lord is going to do in these last days. But there's going to come a time when the vision is going to become clearer. And Lord, my cry today is open my eyes in a greater way. Do like you promised you'd do to the Laodicean church. I shall. Lord, I shall. Lord, touch my eyes. Like the Apostle Paul when he was first converted. Scales fell from off of his eyes. The cataracts were 
removed from off of his eyes. And he saw things clearly. Lord, sharpen my vision. Give me a clearer vision of who you are and what you're doing today. Hallelujah. Is that the cry of your heart today? The Lord will clarify the vision. He'll focus it in closer and closer to what he wants us to see. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. To them that seek the Lord with all their heart, that's who will find the Lord. Hallelujah. That's who he'll be found of, seeking him with all of their heart, sitting on the edge of their seat, looking for what the Spirit of God is saying, resting themselves. Woe to those that are at ease in Zion, the Scripture says. Woe to those that are at ease in Zion, that can sleep when God is speaking, that can sleep when the Spirit of God is moving and stirring us. Woe to those that are at ease in Zion. Fat Jeshurun, waxing fat upon all the prosperity that the Lord has poured out upon this United States, upon Christianity, waxing fat and turned away from the Lord, not giving Him the honor and the glory that's due unto His name. Those words penetrated my heart the other night, Brother Mears, when you read those verses from the book of Deuteronomy. How the people can turn away it can happen to me. It can happen to you. It's happened to generations in our time and before our time. It happened unto Israel. All the things God delivered them from, and then once they entered into the land, once God put the ice down, once God began to bless them and prosper them and give them peace, then they uh, turned away from the Lord, and they turned unto other idols. I was thinking of a song the other day that uh, we sing from time to time, and it talks from... From my heart, all the idols torn. I can't remember the name of that song. But uh, uh, do you remember the name of that song? The Lily of the Valley. I have from my heart all these idols torn in this United States. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. In this United States, we do not have little statues. Oh, there's some that do. But the idols that are here in the United States are idols that are in the heart. Amen. Movie idols. And uh, sport idols. Car idols. You know, I, I, I could just pick on anything. It would just be whatever it is that any of us, uh, all these different things of the flesh and of the spirit and of, uh, of the things of the world that become idols, that, that rob us of our time and our attention, to the Lord and the things that are important to Him. Lord, I want to do like those different reformers in the Old Testament did. Those kings that were reformers. They would go and knock down Baal's groves. They would tear down the idols. They would pull the idols uh, clear of all the high places that had been set up and remind the people to worship the Lord. All these idols, they tear and they destroy and they have a way of uh, um, looking for the right word of embalming you and causing you to be um, deadened and have an anesthetic administered to you and kind of put a, a deadness around you and cause you to be in a stupor. That's the word I'm looking for. The idols of this world will cause you to be in a stupor. Have you ever been so tired? Have you ever been without sleep? That you're walking, you're driving, but you're just doing it out of mechanics? Listen, I've driven a car. I've driven a car and wondered when I got into my driveway how I got there. I cannot even remember leaving the place of work and getting home. What was I in? I was in a stupor. My eyes were open. I was moving the wheel, stopping at signals, but I wasn't really even alert to what I was doing. You could have waved at me, said hi, honked your horn or anything. I wouldn't even have known it. I was in a, just a stupor. My mind was all clouded. Spiritually, you can be like that. You can be in a spiritual stupor going through all the motions. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Clapping your hands, singing the songs, quoting scriptures, being in attendance, doing all the right things at the right time, and still being a stupor, not really even knowing what you're doing. Lord, don't let that happen to me. Spare me, Lord. I want to be fully alive to what the Spirit of God is saying today. Whatever it takes, Lord. If it takes words, strong words from the Word of God, if it takes the Spirit of God touching me and shaking me around, Lord, I want to not be in a stupor. I don't want to be at ease in Zion. 
but I want to be found ready. I don't want my talent to be buried in the earth, wrapped in a napkin, afraid of what God might do and say to me if I step out of line, but I want to be occupying until he comes. Hallelujah. Praise God. When we occupied the land of Germany after World War II, that was not just sitting down. There were men that had their guns ready. There was a police force, and anything that looked like it was out of the way, they went over there and put it down. It was called occupying Germany. That's what Jesus meant when he said, occupy till I come. He meant take territory. He meant hold the land. He meant keep it in control. Lord, I want to occupy. Occupy doesn't mean just sitting down. It means what I just said, what we did with the different territories that were conquered after World War II. They occupied them. They kept them in control. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord today. Praise his name today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord out of your soul. Praise God. Lord, make me alive to what you're saying today. Make me alive. Whatever it is that's caught my attention, that's stolen from me, anything. Listen. The Lord is wanting a people to take him at his word, to come up higher, to reach in after him. I feel that so strong inside of me. I feel a conviction of the Holy Spirit today to draw closer to him, to listen to his word. Hallelujah. Praise God. I feel wonderful in the spirit of God today. I'm thankful for what I'm feeling. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I sense it from all of you today. You feel the same way in the Lord. We're looking for something in the Lord today. We're looking for something in the Lord. We've not come for just another pretty sermon, which we don't receive pretty sermons around here. We receive messages from God. But that's not why we come here today, to hear just some, some little, some little salve some little tidbit, some little story, some little nice encouragement of how you can make it through tomorrow. But we're here today to be at the throne of God. We're coming before a king today. We're coming before the king today. Don't bring your little petitions, your little toenail problems, your little sore foot problems. We're coming before the king, almighty king. Do you have large petitions? He's a great king. Don't insult the king with just little things that are bothering you. If you have big problems, bring him before the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He does great things. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We come before your throne, Lord. Hallelujah. We come before your great throne, Lord. entrance and the access. Thank you, Lord. Don't you see it? Can't you see it in the spirit? The scepter of righteousness, his righteousness. He's extending the scepter to the queen. She's deemed access into the throne room. The scepter is there. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You don't need to hide behind the wall. You don't need to be afraid of showing your face. The scepter is there through Jesus. The scepter has been extended to you. What is it you need? The scepter is there. Come on in. Bring it before the king. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. That kind of thinking, that kind of thought from the Spirit of God gets me excited. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Sky is clear outside. <clears throat> There's a fresh color inside the building we're meeting together here with today. And the Holy Spirit is here to give us clear sky in the spirit and a fresh, clean feeling inside, washing our 
hearts and our conscience. And Jesus said, our Lord, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you know, that's only possible through the Spirit of God is to have a pure heart. Only through his working of his word and his spirit. I'm thankful today that I have an opportunity, as, as Brother said here to, uh, today in his testimony, we have a reason to be thankful to God and give him praise. Brother Michael, I'm praising God with you also today. There's not many people that have back surgery that are up doing like Brother Michael has been doing almost from the beginning. And I believe the Lord's hand is in all things. Hallelujah. I really do. And I thank God for that. It's a testimony even where we work. Um, to the men, they know Brother Michael is a Christian. He's given his testimony through the years there. They all know that he's been trusting the Lord. And when they heard that he was having such a good recovery, I heard several of them, they didn't want to admit it, but they had to admit it, that there must be something there that he's getting some special help with because they know in our line of work, men just have bad backs and they have discs removed and vertebrae uh, fused together and some of them never come back to work. Some of them never are able to walk again. And so we're thanking the Lord today for His hand on our lives and His Spirit. And there's no telling what the Spirit of the Lord is going to give us here today. Brother Miller uh, read this scripture Friday night from the uh, second chapter of Ephesians about uh, uh, it said that, uh, that God might show in the ages to come just how abundant of a mercy and grace He has shown upon us. You know, we really don't comprehend yet fully just what abundant mercy and grace God has bestowed upon us. When we are enthroned with Christ as his redeemed from the earth, the Bible refers to that group of people in several different ways. One is referred to as a man child and the other is referred to as the bride, the lamb's wife seated at his right hand, sharing with him, as Paul the Apostle said, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. When we recognize in that enthroned, exalted position that the Lord is holding out to all of his people, that he's touched by his spirit, when we're sitting there with Christ, ruling over this world and its affairs for a thousand years, and then that special privilege that will continue to be ours, on beyond the thousand years because we're like him in every way that it's, poss it's possible to be duplicated. We will have been duplicated like him in every way that it's possible for us to be uh, made like him. Hallelujah. When we sit there and it's finally soaked into our uh, consciousness after a thousand years have gone by that we have taken place, we have taken the place that was held by angels. Hallelujah. We have taken the place that uh, uh, Paul the Apostle, he said, uh, the world that we speak of has not been put under the authority of angels. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than angels, but thou hast uh, created him, and uh, what does it say? Given him... Uh, power and glory. Hallelujah. Jesus, it says, Paul says that we do not see yet man exalted with power and glory. But we see Jesus. He's saying we don't yet see the fulfillment of that psalm, the eighth psalm, saying we see man exalted with power and glory. But we do see one man. <clears throat> There's one man that is exalted with power and glory, and he tasted of death for every man. He was made a little lower than the angels to taste of death for every man, and we see Jesus. He's the one. He's the man that's been exalted with power and glory. Hallelujah. And since that one man is now seated at the right hand of the Father, a glorified man, hallelujah, a lot of people, they may not appreciate referring to Jesus as a glorified man, but Paul the Apostle, he says there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and I really am thrilled with that thought that there's a man 
seated up there. Oh yes, he was with the Father before he ever was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. But he is all man, hallelujah, as well as all God, seated up there. And he's waiting expectantly. In fact, he's not only so confident that we're going to be there with him, it says that he is now seated henceforth expecting until all enemies are brought and made subject unto him. He's not like other priests that existed before him in the nation of Israel. They were constantly standing and walking and ministering <clears throat> in all of their offices. But it says this high priest, he is so confident of the uh, final results that he is now seated. He's no longer standing, needing to minister anymore. He is seated, expecting until all foes and all enemies are brought subject unto him. Hallelujah. He's waiting for you and for me. Hallelujah. The forerunner is already there, and he's made the way open for every one of us. He's expecting until we complete our trip, our journey, and our race. Hallelujah. Jesus... I believe you're not going to be disappointed in anything. Hallelujah. I believe that. He which hath begun a good work in us is able to perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. We've got everything we need here. That uh, uh, verse of scripture Brother Mears read to us uh, Friday night following the scripture that Brother Miller read from the first chapter of Ephesians when it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Hallelujah. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. We have it here available to us here today. And you know, people uh, do not seem to understand simple things that they learn in life growing up in the natural and that they apply in the spiritual also. <clears throat> in the natural, we reach plateaus where we level off for a period of time, but as we keep working and as we keep developing, then we hit another climb and we hit another ascension and our ability in different levels as well as in education as well as in natural development begin to uh, change from that plateau and hit it again. Um, John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, in his... Uh, um, allegory of a pilgrim on his way to the celestial city he said that the pilgrim when he started out with such joy was going along real good until he hit the slaw of despondency and there he fell into the slaw of despondency and wondered why he had ever started the trip at all and it wasn't until he was able to come out of the slaw of despondency that he recognized he could still make it for the gate to that city and you know, that man wrote that while he was in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ a couple of hundred years ago in England. And he had recognized something uh, in that allegory that uh, the scriptures are full of and we need to keep ever present in our minds is that there can be a slaw of despondency. There can be a plateau that a person can reach. When a person learns something, whatever it is, whether it's a, a talent, a skill, or educationally, you will hit a level. Think back for a minute. In every trade that you've, uh, if you have a trade that you've developed and you've uh, served in a apprenticeship, if you have a, a skill, uh, even in education, you will reach a level where it feels like you can't learn anymore. It feels like you've reached your peak. Uh, you've peaked out. They learned this first in uh, the telegraph, in teaching the, the system of the telegraph. They found out people could not learn to do it any faster and any better with the telegraph. But the ones that kept on practicing after several weeks, all of a sudden, they hit another climb and they were able to run the telegraph faster and more efficient and more capable than they had ever been. And they did, had no explanation for it except they hit a plateau for a while and then they began to climb again. I learned that in playing tennis. You could go out there and you could practice and you know there would be a period of time there at the first few months of learning to play tennis that uh, boy I was making leaps and bounds of progress every day. My uh, return was better, my serve was better and then I would hit a period where it seemed like I couldn't do any better. You think about it in any any game or skill uh, that you've ever been involved in, well, whether it's golf or basketball or football or uh, just whatever thing it might be in the natural, 
you'll do real good and then you'll hit a level where you're not able to uh, improve upon that and then all of a sudden it seems like you're out there playing and all of a sudden that that serve is coming in and you're acing them every time whereas it wasn't it, you weren't having any success at all <clears throat> what is that that's a level of plateau that you hit for a period of time and you mustn't be discouraged you must believe that you're going to improve and it comes it definitely comes hallelujah there was a man I read about that uh, his golf game was really bad and uh, he was doing all right, but he just became discouraged over his golf game. It was uh, such poor scores. And he finally had made up his mind he wasn't going to play golf anymore. And one of his friends that was playing with him, he said, you know, he said, before you give up the game completely, because you've enjoyed it, why don't you go see one of the masters, the pros, and ask him to watch you take a few swings and watch your style and see if there isn't something he can suggest for you. And so he went over and saw the pro, and the pro said, yes. He said, what's the matter? is you need to change your grip. It's the way you're gripping this club. You know that man changed that grip the way he was gripping that club and within a few days his golf game was improved tremendously. He didn't need to give up the game. He needed to change his grip. And you know the Lord has told us through the Apostle Paul that we need to lay hold on to eternal life. You and I have grabbed on to the right thing. Right. Eternal life. And if it seems like in this growth towards being like Christ, the scriptures use this word of maturity and full development in Christ. One of the words that the scriptures use is perfection. It means full growth. It means maturity. It means becoming a master at what you're doing. You've mastered uh, the flesh. You've mastered the desires of the flesh. If it seems in your growth towards the Lord that you've hit a plateau, you don't need to change the goal. You may just need to change the grip. You've laid hold on eternal life. Just let the master talk to you. Ask him, say, Lord, I've, uh, I've gone as far as I can go and it seems like that I've just hit a, a plateau and I'm not climbing like I used to. The Lord has something different to give to us. There's a change for all of us that's in the wings. The nation of Israel, it says, the scripture tells us, uh, someone was telling me yesterday that the nation of Israel changed its location in the wilderness 42 times while they were in the wilderness for 40 years. 42 times they changed their location. Did you know that the majority of those changes took place in the last year or two that they were in the wilderness? They only changed their location a few times in the first 38 years. But those last two years, they really got busy. And the Lord had them pull up stakes and move to another location. When he had accomplished what he wanted in that location, pull up stakes. In just a short period of time, the cloud was changing rapidly. And they were making changes in preparation because they were getting ready to go over Jordan. They were getting ready to go into the promised land and to conquer the promised land and defeat the ites that were there. This has been a long time coming in the journey coming out of the wilderness. But we're near to the time of the end. We're near to the time when we're getting ready to cross over Jordan into Canaan's fair land. Hallelujah. And there's changes. You've been making changes for years. But they're not fast enough anymore. There's some changes that have to be made with the people of God rapidly, in succession. The cloud is, is rising up from off the tabernacle and changing locations. And where you've been able to drive your roots in and be satisfied for a period of time, you're going to need to sh drive those roots in, those stakes in just shallow. Because you don't know tomorrow the cloud may tell you to change and do it different. Hold on to eternal life, and if you've hit a plateau, change your grip a little bit. Ask the Lord how you can improve your swing just a little bit. Hallelujah. I believe these changes are in, uh, in the wings for the people of God. They're just out in front of us. Hallelujah. So if you've been worshiping the Lord in just a certain way, you need to change a little bit. You need to open up to the Lord a little bit. Hallelujah, I need, to, I need to do something a little different than I've been doing for several years. Hallelujah. If your natural stance has been... Now, now listen, this is my natural stance, so don't, uh, don't think I'm picking on you. But if your natural stance has been to just sit there or stand there and put your hands up like this and open your mouth and say, Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, that's good. 
That's real good. But maybe the Lord wants you to change it just a little bit. Maybe he wants something different, a little different out of the heart. Hallelujah. Maybe he wants you to raise them a little higher. Maybe he wants you to open your mouth a little wider. Maybe he wants a little more volume of praise to come out. Maybe he wants a little more intensity of worship to rise up from down inside and give vent to the Lord. Hallelujah. And if you've never ran, maybe you're supposed to run. If you've never danced, maybe you're supposed to dance. If you've never clapped your hands, maybe you're supposed to clap your hands. If, uh, if you've never walked around, maybe you're supposed to walk around. If you've never hugged a brother, uh, maybe that's what the Lord wants you to do. If you've never expressed your love and appreciation for someone else in the kingdom of God, maybe the Lord wants you to do that. There's some changes. Hallelujah. We don't want to get in a rut in our ways. We want to ha allow the Spirit of God to come into our midst. Brother Mears has been speaking to us of changes that are coming to the body of Christ. Consider your ways. Consider your ways, the Lord is saying to us. I want the Lord to know that I'm willing to consider my ways. Hallelujah. Glory. Don't get so quiet on me right now. <laughs> I, I really believe the Lord wants us to make some changes in the way we listen to the Word of God. If you've sat there and uh, you've been falling asleep at different times because of uh, whatever, whether it's your low blood sugar or whether it's age or whether it's because you stayed up too late or because you didn't eat the proper nutrition uh, this morning or last night, if it's because... Uh, uh, you know, whatever it might be. You ate a Twinkie. You know, they claim that guy up there in San Francisco, he went berserk and killed people because he ate a Twinkie. It's known as the Twinkie Defense. The Twinkie Defense. Can you imagine that? That guy went free. He's dead now, isn't he? Didn't he kill himself or something like that? Well, I don't know what the whole story was with that, but honestly, I would have been embarrassed to be a lawyer and defend a man that cold-bloodedly murdered somebody and tell him it was because he ate a Twinkie. <clears throat> well, we don't want to miss what God is going to say here today because somebody ate a Twinkie <laughs> or ate some M&Ms. If you've been eating uh, uh, candy during church and it's uh, causing you to go berserk, <laughs> get hyper and you're not able to listen to the Word of God, change it, throw it away. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you've not been sitting on the edge of your seat when the Word of God is coming forth, try sitting on the edge of your seat. Try lifting your feet up off the ground just a little bit. And concentrate. Give your mind and your, your heart and your soul to the Word of God. Let it be written by the, not the fleshly, not on the tables of stone, but by the Spirit of God. Write the Word of God on the fleshly tables of our hearts. Hallelujah. The Word of God's been flowing like a river. It's been food on a table. We need to get every bit of it. Hallelujah. There's great things in store for us right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got everything we need if we'll avail ourselves of it. The Spirit of God in all of its richness. The Word of God in all of its nutrition is here. Hallelujah. People to encourage you. People to instruct you and tell you the right way to go. There's no reason you can't end up being a full stature son of God. When the final bell is rung, you can stand there at full stature looking the Son of God eye to eye. Hallelujah. Not looking at Him down here. Oh, no. It says until we come to the full stature. That means someday you're going to be able to look the Son of God eye to eye. Hallelujah. In full stature. Glory. What prospects are in front of us. Hallelujah. That thrills me, doesn't it, you? Yeah. To think that the growth is here. Hallelujah. And I can feel the growth. Hallelujah. Can you feel the sap? It's rising up in the tree. Hallelujah. We're drawing it. Hallelujah. Today when we are singing those songs, the sap is coming. Hallelujah. It's rising up. Fruit is going to bud out real soon at the extension of these branches. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Winter is over with. Springtime has come to the people of God. Hallelujah. We can hear the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land now. Hallelujah. Resurrection is here. Oh, my. Hallelujah. Thought I'd just rise here and say a few words. Had no idea that I'd feel this good. I was feeling good. But the Spirit of God, hallelujah, and the Word of God and the people of God, the look on your face today, hallelujah, 
There's people that are seated here today that are going to walk out of here with exactly what you came after. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God.